my title today, um, One Step at a Time, should really resonate with all of you in the room because I'm really here to not force you to go to the gym to exercise and hopefully you'll get that from this talk is that exercise comes in many different levels and in many different forms and and I encourage everyone to find the exercise that you can do and that you enjoy doing the most and so you'll probably hear that many times throughout this talk. So just to give you a brief outline of what I'll talk about today um, just going through most of you guys already know um, statistics and cancer continuum. Um, I'll then just briefly discuss exercise guidelines and then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the myths and truths about exercise because there's a lot of information out there and I'll try to um, disentangle some of that for you. And then um, the last part of the talk will be focused on the strategies that are included in your handout. So if you have it, um, you can look through it and we'll be focusing on that at the last part um, of the talk today. So just to briefly discuss um, the statistics, of course, um, all of us are aware of the, of the frightening statistics that two in every five of us will be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetime. Um, the statistics also suggest that one in two are actually affected by cancer, being that a family member or a, or a loved one or a friend or a colleague has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, me personally, although my research um, started over 10 years ago with, with dragon boating and breast cancer, um, I hadn't been affected by cancer personally up until that point and then in the in the following 10 years um, I lost my father-in-law to brain cancer and my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer so my research ha came full circle in a personal in a personal way as well um, cancer is the leading cause of death in Canada and second to heart disease in the United States and the top cancers in in um, Canada for men are prostate, lung and colorectal and for women breast, lung and colorectal. And uh, there is a 62% survival rate with a big range depending on the types of cancers that we're talking about. And when we talk about doing research in cancer and in terms of physical activity, what we're, we're really focused on is survival versus quality of life. And we really want to put the emphasis on quality of life because it's not just surviving, it's thriving following uh, cancer diagnosis. So to me, of course, exercise is, uh, is one of those medicines that's most in our control. We can't control the types of treatments that we're given or what we need to do to, um, to reduce our risks or of cancer, but we can exercise and change aspects of our lifestyle to help us with our, with, um, our struggles and our challenges. So this is just um, a diagram that I like to show to, to identify that physical activity plays a role in all aspects of what we consider to be the cancer continuum. Um, the um, many researchers sort of use these, these labels, which I don't necessarily like, but what I do like about this figure is to show you that in the early phases of, of a cancer diagnosis, really what we're focusing on around physical activity is to improve functional health, to help people be able to live day to day um, and, and have experience a higher quality of life in those days around functional ability. Um, as we move through the, the um, continuum, where it's a time where there's uh, examination and, con and sort of intermittent treatments that are occurring, what we're focusing on predominantly from a physical activity perspective is quality of life. We really want to help people improve on their quality of life. Um, during this stage that they call permanent survivorship, it's really in the literature defined as that sort of period after the five-year mark, um, but again, hating that term. Um, what we're really focusing on is reducing the risk for secondary cancers and comorbidities that are associated with longer term cancer um, effects. And so for physical activity, we can use physical activity to help reduce those risks. And then in an end of life um, stage of the continuum, we're really focusing on using uh, physical activity as a coping strategy and to reduce levels of stress for both the patient as well as um, the caregivers in that, in that role. So I just wanted to ask, um, how many of you know what Canadians are supposed to do in terms of exercise? How many t days per week are we supposed to exercise? Three. And how many minutes? Three. 30 minutes, okay. Um, so what we often hear are the 150-minute um, rule. So uh, at least five days a week for about 30 minutes is what the Canadian guidelines suggest and, now, and the American um, Cancer Society also recommends that. And then my other question is, how many steps are we supposed to do a day? 
Right. So many people know that stat, 10,000 steps, and I hate it. As a, as a practitioner in physical activity, it is the hardest misnomer to get past people because 10,000 steps is impossible for many, most people, to, to achieve. And so what the 10,000 step rule does, people go out, they buy the pedometer, and they look at it every day, and nowhere close to 10,000 steps, and then you think, oh, throw this away. Um, I'm never going to get there. And, it's, and it sets people up for failure because 10,000 steps. When I were, lived in Montreal, I walked about eight kilometers a day, four kilometers to work, four kilometers back. And I didn't even get 10,000 steps. So when you think about how many people walk eight to 10 kilometers a day, it's really a, an impossible t task. So from this moment forward, whenever anyone asks you that question, say you, there is no <laughs> guideline for steps. So um, I see that you have this as a handout. This is one, these are the new Canada guidelines for physical activity. So offering 150 minutes most days of the week of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. Also integrating some form of um, weight training on at least two of those days. So how many people, how, what percentage of Canadians would you guess are actually meeting those physical activity guidelines? Before we used objective measures and accelerometers where we could actually capture how much activity people were doing, um, the estimate was about 50% of Canadians were meeting guidelines. And we know when, we, when we're asked questions in a self-report manner, many people sort of tend to overestimate or really just don't, ha don't understand what, what they're reporting on. So you think in your head, oh yeah, um, you know, I, I went to the gym, so I left my house at 6 and I got home at 8, so that's two hours of exercise. And meanwhile, you go there, you walk, you talk, you don't really exert yourself and you're probably only doing about 15 minutes of exercise, but on a, on a self-report checklist, it looks like you're doing two hours. So now we have accelerometers which help us measure physical true physical activity and the guidelines and the research shows 15% of Canadians are actually meeting those guidelines. A few more men than women, across the lifespan, that's just the way it always is. Men are a little bit more active than women. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm really glad that you asked that question because until more recently, most of the literature on anything to do with physical activity completely wipes out anything of light intensity that housework is sometimes categorized as. Now, more than ever, there's a big emphasis on housework related activities and some of the, the findings around um, reducing risk of recurrence for breast cancer, let's say, actually show that housework over an extended period of time reduces the risk for breast cancer. So now more than ever, the literature's adding lifestyle type activities and that's the whole purpose of this talk today is to show you that we don't have to focus on the moderate and vigorous you don't have to think about yourself as being completely out of breath when you're exercising to gain benefits so the first myth that, w that I'm going to tell you is um, there are different exercise guidelines for cancer survivors so of course because I have framed this as a myth you know that the answer is inaccurate and in fact the American College of Sports Medicine in 2010 published guidelines for cancer survivors across the board a variety of types of cancers and their guidelines suggested the following avoid inactivity should be as physically active as abilities and conditions allow exercise is safe and effective for a variety of cancers and consensus that all of the guidelines that I'm going to put up are appropriate for cancer survivors so in the American College of Sports Medicine, these are the guidelines. And exactly as you see on the handout for Canadian adults. So there is no difference between Canadian cancer um, statistics and guidelines for physical activity and the adult population. So again, an myth number two, there are special exercise guidelines for different cancer types. Based on the slide that I just had up there, um, you would know the answer to that is that um, there, is no, there are no specific guidelines for different types of cancers. So they have done an extensive amount of research across thousands of research studies, um, predominantly driven by breast cancer and prostate cancer, some colorectal cancer, and certainly other cancer groups are included in many of the studies, more now than, than ever before, um, showing that exercise is, is effective across all cancer types. 
So when we look at, at the statistics of cancer survivors meeting different guidelines, um, I'll draw your attention to physical activity here, but we also have fruit and vegetable consumption, which is um, five to seven servings of fruit and vegetables per day. And smoking is really just smoking or not. We don't really have any other guideline than don't smoke. Um, so as you can see across the board, across different types of cancers, um, physical activity here is between 30 and 40 and almost 50 percent of individuals are meeting guidelines. Now these statistics are based on self-report. So these statistics are, are about 10 percent lower than the Canadian adult population if we're talking self-report percentages. So now we're starting to use accelerometers in, in our research studies to gain better understanding of, of objective measures of physical activity to get a better sense of the percentages. But in general, cancer survivors are doing a little bit less than the general Canadian population. Where we probably should be focusing most of our energy is in fruit and vegetable consumption. Smoking, we're doing much better. So just to point out, in terms of the, co the categories of individuals meeting those guidelines, again, I just wanted to point out percentages across the board of individuals who are meeting physical activity guidelines, meeting physical activity and smoking. Of course, the, the larger percentage of people who are meeting smoking guidelines then drives that percentage up higher here. And in general, the statistics are very low in terms of how many people are meeting physical activity and um, diet guidelines, I would say. And the value of this study really for me is showing that in this study of fruit and vegetables, smoking and physical activity, these researchers showed across um, a large representative sample of cancer survivors that health related quality of life or quality of life for all intents and purposes is significantly affected most by physical activity. So physical activity and quality of life link is much stronger than the link between fruit and vegetable consumption and quality of life or smoking and quality of life. So to me this is a really good message in terms of the importance of physical activity across a range of cancers. So myth number three, you can't prevent cancer with lifestyle. And this is just a, um, a chart from the American Institute for Cancer Research showing that uh, one in three cancer cases can be prevented. Uh, showing a range of lifestyle behaviors that can help prevent cancer but also prevent recurrence and reduce risks of cancer related mortality. So the myth of um, not being able to reduce risks is really, um, is really not uh, feasible. And then a few studies, um, I, this goes back to the household activity, I forgot that I had this in here. So a few studies looking predominantly at breast cancer, um, these are retrospective studies, so following women over, um, not following them, but asking breast cancer survivors um, to think back in their days and their lives if they were active or not. Most of these studies show that um, women who reported strenuous exercise, jogging, um, vigorous and light activity, and the bottom one here, household activity, had lower risks of recurrence uh, over time from their breast cancer. So evidence for prevention of recurrence is, uh, is quite strong as well. Myth number four, there's no time for exercise and it's too late to start now anyways. This is, not con this is consistent across any population that we ever talk to. So the, the caveat to this, or the truth to this, is that any exercise is better than none. So again, the, the guidelines of 150 minutes or the guidelines of 10,000 steps, they're, they're there as a guideline. They're not there as, as your own personal goal. And we'll talk about goal setting a little bit later. But what's important to point out is that um, you need to do what you can do. And, in, and if that's five minutes, if that's 10 minutes, if that's two minutes, that's important and, and you will see benefits long term because you can see cumulative effects of doing two minutes over a certain period of time and then moving to three minutes or to four minutes. So starting small and building up is extremely important for, for physical activity. Um, one of the uh, main researchers at the Mayo Clinic has this term called non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Everybody say that quick five times. <laughs> no? Or you could just use the word neat. Um, and, and this whole idea is the principle that we burn calories just by moving around. So instead of sitting, literally doing any kind of movement, 
revolves around um, a, an activity, I mean an energy balance in versus out. And so any activity is beneficial and his whole line of research is around this and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, one of the biggest principles I guess that is one of the easiest strategies around this exercise idea is really thinking through in your days of, about when you are most inactive and trying to incorporate little bits of activity such as literally standing up. Um, standing up while talking on the phone, walking around um, while talking on the phone, doing you know a, a couple of walks through the rooms in your house, whatever it is to, um, to ha add a little bit of exercise. Um, I gave you some tips on the, on the back page, I think, of the handout of a lot of different strategies that we help people with in terms of thinking about how you can incorporate physical activity into your day a little bit more. So can anyone tell me if you can think about your day when there would be a time when you could add activity to your day? Say it louder. In the evening? In the evening when you're usually doing what? Right, watching TV. <laughs> yeah. So you know, an, a, a really great strategy to try to think about when you're watching TV is on. You know, most maybe a lot of people don't watch commercials anymore because everybody records it and then for fast forwards through the commercials. But I personally like the commercials because it reminds me to get up and to do something. So whether it's walking on the spot or you know doing sit-ups or whatever it is that you can do, even literally one of the biggest exercises that we do with adults is sitting it from a chair to a standing position and then sitting back down. And it really works, the, the largest muscles in your body are your legs and they're the first to go when you, when you do very little. And they're the most important for functional health, they're the most important for balance, and they're most important across the, across the lifespan. And so even little um, standing up out of the couch and sitting back down is, is doing a little bit more for yourself. Um, there's some research showing that individuals who break the, their, their days up by standing up a little bit more frequently actually show better uh, metabolic profiles. So uh, lo have lower weight, have lower cholesterol, have um, less risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease. And so um, it, again, it's, it's really important to follow this sort of neat hypothesis if you can't remember non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Um, so a couple of the act um, strategies that I have listed for you on the back page are active commuting, so going places by walking. Um, if you do have to take the bus or drive, park further away than you normally would. Um, how many of you go uh, shopping and wait for that first spot to come up and drive around until that person comes out of one of the first spots in front of the mall? So if you can just think about how much time you'd spend if you parked in the first spot you found at the back of the parking lot and walked in, you're doing yourself, you're saving time and you're getting some exercise while you do it. Um, the other thing that's really important for individuals going, currently going through treatment um, or even intermittent treatment is that your energy levels and, and fatigue really fluctuate, your, the symptoms of treatment fluctuate from day to day, but there tends to be times during the day where you feel a little bit better or a little bit worse. And so one of the strategies that we often try to help people do is to pay attention during those times of day when you actually feel that it is a little bit better to exercise and so doing these strategies during those times so maybe for some people it's in the morning um, versus waiting till the afternoon when most days may not be that's not necessarily the best time of day to, to think about it and so it really comes down to planning a little bit better knowing yourself and knowing when exercise when you can incorporate that 5, 10, 15 minutes of exercise in your day. I will point out that the guidelines for exercise suggest